Excellencies, Honorable Justice, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I was asked here today to give my personal reflections on the topic of what Gandhi means to me. How did his, his principles affect me personally? And for me, I would say that Gandhi is probably more a symbol rather than a man. And he is a symbol of non-violent struggle to change, of peaceful resistance to oppression. And this principle of non-violent resistance is something that we have all benefited from. For instance, as a woman, I would have benefited from the struggle of the suffragettes in the 19th and 20th century, um, who had a non-violent campaign, who fought a non-violent campaign, so that women would be treated as persons. And in many ways, that battle was still ongoing. But even more personally, even more directly, or rather, maybe closer to home. Nonviolent resistance is perhaps why I'm here today. I was born in um, 1977 in Poland. At the time, Poland was um, under communist rule. Um, the communist regime was installed after World War II. Um, it was oppressive, as such regimes are. Um, it brutally eliminated uh, its enemies. Uh, there were purges of political opponents, shock trials, uh, violent suppression of protests. When I was born in 1977, it was inconceivable that this dream would end within my lifetime. My parents couldn't even dream of it. As a child, the effect was perhaps invisible to me. Children are fairly resilient, we adjust to circumstances. I lived in a small town, it was fairly poor, the economy was bad, um, we had to spend hours in lines at the shop just to get basic ingredients. But we had enough to eat, um, we had healthcare, we had free education, my parents were um, employed. In many ways, we did not suffer, at least physically. The problem was, we were not exactly free to leave. I wanted to travel, but leaving the country was very difficult at the time. Um, you had, to, first of all, to obtain a passport, which was not easy. Uh, you had to get an exit visa, so the government would let you go. Um, you had to, of course, obtain a visa to the country of your destination. Politics and history at school were naturally heavily edited, and the only news really were state news. We had two channels and one didn't work. Connections were needed to get anywhere in life. Bribery and corruption was rampant. We had only one political party, the Communist Party. Now, as an adult, living that sort of, uh, living in that sort of country, uh, you know, it was difficult. The dissent was silenced. Um, if you wanted to enter a profession, uh, you had to become part of the party. You had to keep your head down. You had to keep quiet. And whatever they said. Now, I'm happy to say that I didn't have to experience this as an adult. Because the communist regime, as you probably know, fell. And in 1989, we had the first three elections. I was 12. How did this happen? Well, one answer, one popular answer would be that there was a confluence of political and economic reasons um, that historians are still disentangling. But, one major factor was non-violent resistance, the very principle that Gandhi espoused. There was a group called Solidarność, Solidarity, as we say in English. 
it was a labor union called, um, uh, formed in 1980. And its main strategy was to engage in labor strikes, to peacefully withdraw their labor from the government, peacefully not cooperate with the regime. Now, this was communism, so all employees, pretty much, were state employees. If they stopped working, that hit their pockets quite directly. Of course, the regime didn't go down easy. Um, the, um, the members of Solidarity suffered imprisonment, exile, um, beatings, uh, oppressions, the usual. But eventually, through this peaceful process, and through negotiations, let's not forget that, they prevailed and we got elections. The co-founder of Solidarity was a man called Lech Valenza. And he chose non-violence as a strategy, deliberately. In his um, acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1983, what he said was this. We can effectively oppose violence only if we ourselves do not resort to it. And he was, in fact, at least partially, inspired by Gandhi. Now, as a child, um, I knew who Gandhi was very vaguely. Um, and his ideal of non-violent social change didn't seem quite right to me. Most of all, it didn't seem quite fair to my childish mind. When people are trying to kill you, surely you have the right to try to kill them back, yes? You shouldn't give them the opportunity to try to kill you. When I was a child, this was a childish morality. It was quite simplistic. It was a, a sort of a primitive morality that said, that it's all right to hurt people who hurt you, who disagree with you, who are in the wrong. Well, you hurt them until they admit it, but you're right, don't you? And today, this is kind of how I think about people who, who think that they can use violence to achieve change that they are stuck in this sort of childish mindset. They see their own violence as righteous, as justified in some way. And in that, they become, often, the very monsters that they fight. Happily, others grow up. They understand what Gandhi understood. That you cannot build lasting change forces of your enemies. You never run out of enemies. You just make more and eventually turn on each other. If what you seek is a better life, a better society, you have no choice but to use means other than violence. It's much harder, but it works. There's in fact um, research supporting the fact that it works, and if you are so inclined, um, you can Google it. Um, a political scientist called Erika Chenoweth um, wrote an entire book about it, essentially proving or showing, uh, giving evidence for uh, the fact that non-violent movements succeed much more often than violent ones, and the change that they bring about is more lasting. But it is harder. You must be prepared to sacrifice not just your own life and freedom, which in many struggles for independence, for peace, for regime change, people are prepared to sacrifice. But much harder than that, you have to be prepared to sacrifice your right to vengeance on those who oppress you. You have to give that up. For many people, that is almost impossible to do. Those people who work and risk their lives for peace and freedom are ordinary people, just like us. 
like Valenza, the co-founder of Solidarity, is now a controversial figure in government. There have been some accusations that perhaps he has cooperated with the communist regime that, uh, whilst he was founding Solidarity, that he perhaps spied on some of the people in the organization. Whether those accusations actually have any merit, I have no idea. He is not a saint of human rights. He took away the women's right to abortion in Poland, which was very naughty of him. Um, he made some really quite nasty homophobic remarks at one point in time. He achieved much in his lifetime, but we have to remember he was a man, and as a man he was a product of his time and of his environment. Gandhi as a man, rather than a symbol, probably also not a saint. He strove towards bettering himself all his life. But he was a human being. So non-violence is hard as a practice. It's easy to conclude that only exceptional people can actually commit to such a principle, can truly commit to such a principle. But if we look into the lives of those who practice it, like Lefalanza, like Gandhi, we can quite clearly see it doesn't take a saint. It just takes a choice. What is it that you really want? Is it peace? Is it change? Or is it vengeance? And you are the only one who can make that choice. Thank you very much.